crushing, foaming at every street barricade, lashing round the Bastille. Thomas Carlyle, the Scottish historian, documents the storming of the Bastille in a typically romantic way. Let that prison fortress, tyranny's stronghold, look to its guns. The palace of Versailles, where the king holds court, is quiet. In the vast chambers, all is mystery, not without whisperings of terror. Late at night, the Duke de Leoncourt unfolds the Job's news. Said poor King Louis, why, that is a revolt. Answered Leoncourt, it is not a revolt, it is a revolution. <laughs> the Bastille is fallen. The French Revolution has been called Romanticism in Action. But Romanticism was more than a spirit of political or individual rebellion. It was many things for many people. For some, a worship of nature. For others, a way of life, an artistic movement, a way of thinking and feeling. Historically, Romanticism dominated European life and thought for nearly a hundred years. It had no specific beginning, but its revolutionary course during the 19th century was influenced by the 18th century French philosopher Rousseau, often called the father of Romanticism. His influence on literature, social thought, and politics was profound. Napoleon Bonaparte, arch-hero of early Romanticism, said of Rousseau, I would have fought to the death for him. <laughs> With the fall of the Bastille, a revolutionary fervor swept over France. A young English poet, William Wordsworth, lived in France during a later period of the revolution. In a poem written years afterward, he recollected his youthful enthusiasm. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. France standing at the top of her golden hours. Human nature seeming born again. A spirit abroad which could not be withstood. We should see the people having a strong hand in making their own laws. Standing at the top of her golden hours, a spirit abroad which could not be withstood, and human nature seeming born again. The poem is Wordsworth's autobiographical prelude, written when he was in his thirties. He was just twenty-one in France, enamored with a French girl and with republican ideals. But Wordsworth's ideals were to change. I thought of those September massacres. A river of blood. Of those atrocities. And implements of death. By 1792, Wordsworth had returned to England, deeply troubled by the violent and bloody course the revolution had taken during the reign of terror, he turned elsewhere in spirit. In his words, he yielded himself to nature. Nature, for Wordsworth and other romantic poets, became a religion. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity. One impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good, than all the sages can. Oh, 
wild west wind. Thou breath of autumn's being, thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven, like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. Pestilence-stricken multitudes, wild spirit which art moving everywhere, be thou, spirit fierce, my spirit. The young English poet Shelley and his ode to the west wind. Unlike Wordsworth, who turns his back on rebellion, Shelley was a romantic rebel throughout his tragically short life. The Necessity of Atheism by Jeremiah Stukely. <laughs> you wrote this pamphlet. Did you not pass it? Father, I've done worse than that. Young huh? man, you've been expelled from the university for writing this rubbish. Rubbish, sir? Uh, well, uh, I withdraw that for writing this pamphlet. You understand, of course, that you can be prosecuted in law. Is this true? As your lawyer, I must inform you that it is only too true. Does he? If henceforth you require aid or assistance from me, whether financial or otherwise, you shall pledge yourself to me. But what? You no longer read those books that you've been used to reading. Your mortar broke. And two, that you place yourself under the aid and guidance of such a gentleman as I shall appoint and attend to his religious and political instruction. Father. I can make no pledge to conceal my opinion in political or religious matters. I am accustomed to speak my opinion unreservedly. This has occasioned me some misfortune. I do not therefore cease to speak as I think. Language is given us to express ideas. He who fetters it is a bigot and a tyrant. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf the sacred river ran... A few years later, Shelley was now one of the famous band of English exiles. For six years, their lives crossing and recrossing, at first in Switzerland, later in Italy, and the sensibilities shared by them defining the age of romanticism. The poet, Lord Byron, to many the most romantic figure of the romantic age. That deep romantic chasm which... Mary Godwin daughter of the world's first great feminist. Her mother, the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women. Beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon. Mary's half-sister, Claire Claremont, who cared as little as Mary for society's rules. She was to bear Byron's child. Shelley, still intensely idealistic, otherworldly, a rebel with many causes, and Byron, an aristocrat, yet a hater of kings, in most ways, in fact, individual, unpredictable. Enough, Shelley of Sammy Coleridge, enough! Let the poor devil eat opium to his heart's content, but please not to trouble me with his visions. Now then, I have a proposal. I propose that each of us write a tale of the macabre, a ghostly tale, if you will, a tale of utter horror. Mary Godwin was not unique among the romantics in her fascination with horror, but the novel she conceived some time later was unique. I did not sleep that night. I saw, with shut eyes, but with acute mental vision, the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the horrible thing he had created. I saw the horrible thing at his bedside. On the morrow, I announced to Byron and Shelley that I'd thought of a story. I would call it Frankenstein. Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean. Roll, ten thousand fleets sweep over thee in vain. By 1818, Shelley and Mary, now his wife, had left England for good.
to take up a life of permanent exile until his early death by drowning in 1822. Shelley saw much now of Lord Byron, who was publishing the fourth canto of his already enormously popular poem, Child Harold's Pilgrimage. Oh, I have loved thee, ocean, for I was a child of thee, and trusted Byron. Shelley. Welcome to Venice. Shelley was all but unknown. Byron, the most famous English poet living. His hatred of tyranny and monarchy, his defense in his poetry of the oppressed, captured the European imagination. But in England, while his own countrymen admired and bought his poetry, they hated his politics and gossiped maliciously about his private life. They say many things in England. 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 I left England to escape my peers, a pack of lying, pious hypocrites. Still, my dear Shelley, the great object of life is sensation. To feel that we exist, even in pain. <laughs> but you are utterly mistaken, Byron. Poetry is no trifling matter. Poets are the, the legislators of the world. Legislators of the world? Unacknowledged, I grant you, but nevertheless it's true. <laughs> is it trifling to create greatness and goodness? Poets do. Is it trifling to become a source whence the minds of other men may draw strength and beauty? Poets are such a source. What would humanity be if Homer or Shakespeare had never written? Uh, not that I advise you to aspire to fame. No, by no means. Your work should spring from a purer, simpler motive. You should desire nothing more than to express your own thoughts. My dear Shelley, I shall tell you what poetry means to me. Money. Money? Money. <laughs> Homer or Shakespeare. Money. Oh, poetry. <laughs> Greatness and enough goodness. Enough. Shelley. I go soon to Greece. To Greece. Why Greece? Greek patriots are training armed bands against the Turkish tyranny. I shall join them in my person and with my money. I begin to be bored with this life, Shelley. At least it will be action. Good, bad, foolish, or fatal. It is my destiny. Byron's adventure in Greece was perhaps foolish and certainly fatal. He died there of fever in 1824. Action was not his destiny. Another hero of the early romantic period was a man of action. Napoleon Bonaparte. He was eventually to seize absolute power and crown himself Emperor of France. But earlier, in 1796, he was the romantic hero, the one man who had spread the ideals of the French Revolution throughout Europe. In the words of the German romantic poet Goethe, his life the stride of a demigod. Another German who admired the early Napoleon was the great composer, Ludwig van Beethoven. That part again, Rhys. Read it to me. Oh, yes, of course, Herr van Beethoven. Um, peoples of Italy, the French army comes to break your chains. The French Republic is the friend of all nations, receivers with trust. For our only quarrel is with the tyrants who have enslaved you. He will liberate the Italians, you shall see, Rhys. And not only that, he will bring freedom to all Europe. Perhaps even to musicians and composers, eh? Do you know what it was like when I was a youth? We musicians were uniformed servants in the houses of great noblemen. Servants, Reese. Slightly above the parlour maids, it is true. 
but beneath the pastry cook. And our music, music was considered the art of pleasing sounds. Done to order, like the souffle from the Lord's kitchen. <laughs> Come, Reese, come. Have I Beethoven, my, my lesson? Can come later, Reese, later. This is a great day, a day of days. Go to nature, Reese, to nature in all her beauty, and set your heart at rest about what must be. Nature, to Beethoven, was the peaceful or turbulent background against which very often his musical thoughts took shape. On our walk that morning, he muttered, and I must admit it, howled the whole time. When I asked him what he was doing, he answered, Eh? Hey, a theme for the Allegro of the Sonata has occurred to me. <laughs> feelings of fear and suffering, an infinite longing, the essence of romanticism. More than this, Beethoven was one of the great musical innovators, and this in spite of a terrible physical affliction which might well have blighted his musical life. Beethoven's hopes that Napoleon would bring freedom to Europe proved tragically false. Beethoven, like most romantic artists, was disillusioned. Napoleon's soldiers swarmed over the continent. The revolutionary dream of liberty, equality, fraternity. Now, a nightmare. But finally, after his defeat at Waterloo in 1815, Napoleon was exiled. In Shelley's words, a fallen tyrant. And with Napoleon's fall, monarchy was restored to France. Thus, the gains of the revolution seemed lost forever. But then, in 1830, three glorious days. I have undertaken to paint a modern subject. A street barricade of the three glorious days. 
If I did not fight for my country, at least I will paint for her. Those were three days of wonderful fraternity. Everywhere rang the call to arms. And for the first time, workers, artists, students joined in a common cause, greeted each other as brothers, and stood side by side on the firing line. The words of Alexander Dumas, romantic novelist. The painting, Liberty Leading the People, by Delacroix. Romantic artist. They call me a romantic. If by my romanticism is meant the free expression of my feelings, my disdain for the standardized painting of the schools, my dislike of academic formula, then I must confess that not only am I a romantic, but that I was one at the age of 15. Music, painting, poetry, the novel, the drama. Romanticism embraced all the arts. Painters influenced poets. Poets influenced musicians. Among Delacroix's closest friends from the other arts was Georges Sand, the immensely popular and controversial novelist, and the Polish composer Chopin, whose music, a critic wrote, was romantic sadness intensified. Delacroix appreciates music. His taste is sure and exquisite. The words of Georges Sand. Delacroix painted a portrait of her with Chopin at the piano. He never tires of listening to Chopin. He worships his music. Chopin was desperately ill during the last ten years of his life and was to die young, as so many of the romantics did. Chopin is a musician, only a musician. His thoughts can come out only in music. The poet Baudelaire likens Chopin's music to a bird of paradise fluttering over the horrors of the abyss. fluttering over the horrors of the abyss. Delacroix paints that abyss. His images, those of warfare, of hunted animals, of the exotic and sensual, and in the end, of appalling violence. of the abyss. Prophetic words for romanticism. By the late 1870s, the Industrial Revolution, the ultimate horror to most romantics, had all but submerged the romantic movement. But what of the romantic impulse, the spirit of romanticism? Does it live on today?